Hello, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the VidCon Now Asia edition. Uh, if you've been tuning in recently, you'll know that we've taken everyone on a grand tour of Asia. Uh, so far visiting China, Vietnam, and most recently, incredible India. Uh, this week, we're stepping off the train to go on a deep dive into the exciting world of user-generated content. And I'm looking forward, personally, to learning a lot. We have a fantastic panel of speakers, um, and to th this week's captain to take us on our journey is Ravi Pillai. He's the Managing Director uh, of Asia Pacific of Jukin Media. Uh, uh, and before I hand over to you, Ravi, I will ask everyone again out there in the World Wide Web, please don't forget to ask questions. That's what the, the speakers are there for. But Ravi, over to you, sir. Thank you, Jasper, and thank you, VidCon, for having us. VidCon has by far been my favorite video conference uh, to attend all over the world. Folks, if you haven't been, you must. Uh, it's a lot of fun, a lot of learning. So I really must thank VidCon for letting us talk about something that we on this panel and a number of us in the industry are very passionate about, which is user-generated content. What does user-generated content mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to a creator, to an advertiser, to a publisher, to uh, an OTT platform? It could mean anything. It could mean various forms, various lengths, various types of content. There's so much to learn about. But the, the main thing that we want to talk about today is how do we inspire people to tell better stories using their devices? How do we teach people all over the world to utilize their strengths and their, their creativity to come up with content that you know is going to be useful, that is going to make an impact, and that is going to make money. How do we extract value from this content? Um, we've seen an evolution of UGC over the over the decades. Jukin, in fact, as a company, the reason why I'm in this in this position to be able to speak about this, we've gone from door to door, knocking on doors of agencies and brands, saying, "Hey, would you like to use this content?" in your in your prom promo or in an ad and you know we were turned away saying UGC is low quality this was many years ago cut to now where Jukin has done over a thousand campaigns we've paid out over 25 million dollars to creators um, we own uh, and operate some of the world's biggest social video brands such as fail army people are awesome the pet collective uh, poke my heart this is happening we have a collective audience of over 210 million people following these brands globally we, have, we, our users consume our content for over 600 million minutes a month on OTT platforms. The average daily user time is almost an hour. The stats are staggering. Um, over 80% of the content that uh, we consume online generally as a population is, is user generated. So, you know, why are we not extracting more value out of this content? And that is something that we want to explore here on this panel. Uh, before we move, on to introducing our esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, we'll show you a little bit of a video that shows you what is the type of content that we're, we're talking about, and then we'll go into the session. You can look at them. Oh my God, are you pregnant? <laughs> Yes. 
So <clears throat> welcome, everyone. Uh, folks, I, I'm so excited about this panel. I want to introduce you to an amazing set of folks. I have Chanpreet Arora, the co-founder of Resilient Digital and the former CEO of Vice India, a specialist and expert in this, if there ever was one. Um, I have Ayn Halid, who is the marketing communication manager of BMW Indonesia. As we all know, BMW is a very creative and exciting brand that does some amazing things all over the world. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. And my friend, Ashley Amana, who is the chief business and growth officer at Wonderman Thompson, which again, as we all know, is one of the most progressive and forward thinking agencies. I love the way they use data in, in their business. And I'm really excited to hear about what Ashley thinks about UGC. Um, so I'm going to start with Chanpreet. Um, Chanpreet, welcome. And tell us a little Thank bit you about yourself and why UGC, why UGC is so important to you. Um, so a little bit about myself is that I've probably worked on every single brand that went from print to TV and from TV to digital in the past 18 years. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey I just chanced upon. But I had the privilege of working with brands like Discovery, Vice, New York Times, Thomson Reuters, uh, and uh, and many more in India. Local brands going uh, going national. What's been really interesting in the journey for um, for news where I started in media, uh, or whether it was radio, uh, going from uh, fully regulated to an FM first market where. We, ha we saw five or six new radio stations were swimming every day, was local, hyper-local content uh, and citizen-first content taking precedence. So uh, our, first, uh, mm -hmm. our first memory in India was when we found out about Michael Jackson passing away and it came through the internet in 2009, June 25th. Uh, on Twitter, and it wasn't a big breaking story from Times of India or Hindustan Times. Uh, we knew something had changed fundamentally. Here. And uh, cut to now in 2021, every newsroom strategy, every editor in chief in India today uh, works with a lot of technology, a lot of independent contributors of content, whether it's video or text or audio and with a very limited amount of staff in-house. And it's really changed the way we do business. And uh, if we look at it from a video first advertising point of view, the entire journey that we have taken uh, from going from content to brand conversations has got completely democratized with, instead of having one single voice or a one single big Bollywood star talking about what matters, to multiple communities finding their own space in the digital first world. And uh, each of these communities finding a voice, making these community leaders and their content and their voices very critical, whether we look at it from a content point of view or a business point of view. So that's great. So what do you think publishers should be thinking of when they look at UGC? And what should the creator be thinking of when they when they create their content, when they're citizen journalists, when they're out on the street today, capturing moments, if something happens in London or in New York, why is that important for a publisher to sort of, you know, aggregate that content, use that content? So I just want to clarify here from a publisher's point of view, there are clearly two different type of publishers. You can be in the business of managing and curating uh, user user generated content or you can be in the business of very specifically looking at curated and owned content. The moment you go into UGC content, whether it's a face, whether it's a social media first kind of platform, it's a very different beast, whether it's the technology, it's the curation, it's the regulation that you come under becomes very difficult. So I think the first thing I just want to say is that the moment you look at UGC, you have to look at curation along with it. UGC on its own, um, is a very difficult proposition to sustain. Um, when, when we look at publishers who are looking at UGC, there are two or three things that they're doing right consistently, which is a good sign on who we work with also as brands or as publishers on both sides. 
number one is do they have the right technology to be able to tag identify and curate the content from a tech perspective uh, enabling reach and discoverability second is in uh, second is being able to curate it from a pure um, brand safety and a regulatory compliance point of view because in every country just and also in india there are severe implications for uh, incorrect content i don't want to give any labels of what incorrect is or what negative content is or whatever is sensitive content the way it comes onto a platform needs to be managed properly to ensure that a it's in line with the tonality of the pla- publisher as well as of the advertisers and audiences that it serves um so these two would be primary for me i just want to give an example of what i really mean there is a, a relatively small uh, platform called parenttune.com it's the number one social media platform for parents in india and as i've been advising them for the past couple of uh, years almost a uh, couple of years one thing i've realized they've done beautifully is identify uh, three things they've done beautifully one is they have a technology that rates the content that is generated in terms of its authenticity it's about its helpfulness these are parameters that matters to its own audiences which helps them build trust in the community the second thing they've done is they've clearly identified the most impactful voices that matter the most and then they actually go ahead and aid these uh, content creators through training through brand support and uh, simply through discoverability as well actually creating one of the most um, robust ambassador programs as they call it which is really helping put a link between brands the audiences and build the community at the same time so that sounds like a fantastic organization how 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 do creators get to connect with organizations such as this and on a larger scale you know publishers we you mentioned curation which is which is something i'm very interested in i'm very close to because i too believe that the vastness is impossible to to organize and structure and you know curation is the answer it is the only way facebook and google and all the big platforms are spending a lot of time and money today to curate and i'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well but um how does a creator get its content onto a Times of India or Hindustan Times or uh, you know, BBC or wherever. So okay, uh, I don't want to take a specific organization as an example, but if I were a curator, uh, if I were a content generator, I need to be clear about who I am and what is my community. I'm now taking you back in a journey of whether where the way I look at business, and I look at business in a way that there is. i am now serving needs of a community as a publisher or as a brand i am fulfilling a need of my consumer and most of the consumers now in this world of social expression are connected in communities we need to understand that every publisher is serving certain communities and every brand is probably uh, looking at serving those communities in a very different way we need to be clear you as a content creator need to be clear of which community are you a part of and whose voice are you becoming the moment you know whose voice you are and you are i'm assuming the one thing that is very strong and the reason why ugc works is its authenticity if you are going to be authentic to your content creation publishers will reach out to you and ideally curation agencies should be the first uh first way forward because uh, brands are very skeptical and i'm sure ian and ashley will share more on that but uh brands are very skeptical of taking risks when it comes to brand tonality and brand safety that becomes a big challenge uh, i just want to give you a small example uh, there is this really big um, uh, uh, really big mobile phone manufact m- mobile phone brand which launched a uh, cell phone recently in in the super premium category competing with the apple iphone most premium version and they reached out to some of the uh, some of the curator some of the ugc content creators and reviewers on youtube one of them who had been a regular with the brand 
got so excited because he wanted to go a step ahead and show something which would be fantastic to the brand and land up creating a never done before set for the brand. It costed him a lot more money. The impact was terrible and the brand had to pull down the content and actually had to work really hard to make sure that none of the links would survive. So, you know, this is a classic case of a brand working with UGC, however, and there not being any curation or filter or no sure. long term association. Uh, which can create a lot of trouble. So I would say long-term association, knowing your communities would be great. Copyright management. Folks, that's a huge takeaway. Um, if you're going to learn anything from Chanpreet's session, you know, the, the importance of doing it right, working with UGC in the right way is very, very important. Time just flies when you're having fun, Chanpreet. I want to ask you about uh, UGC and OTT platforms, but I'm going to move to uh, Ayn for a second. Uh, and then when we come back to uh, uh, later on, we're going, we're going to talk about uh, UGC on OTT platforms. Um, thank you for that. That was so insightful. Um, folks, we're going to take a little different tact. Uh, the reason I said this is such a great panel, you're going to learn about publishers and OTT. You're going to learn about brands and then agencies. So let's. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how <clears throat> UGC is used in branded content. And then we'll move to Ayn from BMW. Let's get this party started. Alexa, tell me a joke. How does NASA organize a party? They plan it. <laughs> Alexa, what's in figgy pudding? What is photosynthesis? Photosynthesis is a process. Alexa. 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 <laughs> open garage door. Turn on front door. Okay. Alexa, open rock out loud. Yay! Hey, let's rock out loud. Alexa, you have mad skills. I try. Alexa, turn on the Christmas tree. Alexa, play the goat. Okay. Alexa, play happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Alexa, turn on the fireworks. Thank you. Can you believe it's been five years? That's 1,826 days. Wanted full of that nutritious milk, super collar fragilistic, vitamin D delicious milk. Looking like a snack milk, love you, that's a fact milk. Check out what you made, chocolate chip, hip, hooray milk. Who would I hit the spot milk? Question Got milk? That was fun to watch. Um, Ayn, welcome, welcome again. Hi. Um, thank you for taking hi, hi, thank you for taking the time. Um, what did you think of those? What do you think of you? First, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, and then. What do you think about UGC and why are brands and advertisers putting so much emphasis on using UGC at the heart of their campaigns? Okay, thank you, Rafi. Thank you so much for having me uh, this afternoon. So I'm Ain Halid. I'm the marketing manager for BMW Indonesia. So um, a little bit about myself, maybe I can say that I have been across the pond, let's say that. All of my career I've spent as a journalist and uh, as chief editors and also maybe as like Rafi in the publisher side as well. So this is like kind of like my third year saying yes to BMW uh, as the market, their marketing manager. So what maybe I could share to the uh, platform um, itself is like uh, from brand side is uh, three years ago when everything going really digitalized as in a, in, in a marketing strategy they feel they need someone to really understand content. That's also where I come, come in basically. So that's where marketing really look deeply into um, what is also uh, UGC. So if by that Rafi, if you say, um, what is the importance right now for brand 
to really look through and really have a strategy in their marketing uh, plan is because, first of all, UGC creates and promotes authenticity. That's first thing first. And also it creates um, honesty. Um, and also it sounds um, very authentic. And it also in the long run will create loyalty to our customers as well. So in marketing, uh, maybe to be kind of like clear in brand team, we always have to be driven in terms of like, what is our return of investment in terms of investing in UGC. So now we are looking through that there are uh, pro progress in terms of shifting and drive pur purchasing decisions. That's how uh, brand, brand will see UGC basically, Ravi. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and what, mm. what trends are you seeing that the brand is looking at, you know, user generated trends, uh, different ways that consumers are creating content? It's evolved, right? People have gotten smarter, devices yes. have gotten better. So, so how are yes. you viewing that? Okay, so basically, um, I have to just uh, maybe share where we see as a brand because I'm currently working uh, in a luxury automotive industry. So it is already a very well known and heritage brand. So basically, when you see UGC with this type of brand, you have to, we have as a marketer, really understand where the brand sits in the market right now. What, how is the brand preserved in Indonesia? Because I think that con, co, can correlate in what type of UGC that we're looking for. Is it something more into UGC, into branding, or is it something into creating a certain campaign or awareness? Or even, let's say we are even pushing to create UGC that create um, tactical sales even to just communicate and make a higher conversion at the end of the day. So um, basically, basically, the trends we are keeping up, it's always different, but we always categorize in terms of what is the objective of the campaign itself. That's where we pinpoint who is we are who are the UGC that we're looking for, who are the content creator, or even we can engage with publisher or even creative producer to create a certain UGC to, in, to generate like a more directed UGC. That's kind of- So that was actually side. going to be, so you actually answered a question I had, which was what would you tell a creative produ uh, producer or a creator, you know, when they're creating content for either a luxury brand or for other, you know, other types of brands. And you, yeah. you touched upon um, that I, just now. Yes. Okay. So basically to be very direct, I hope that, that the one that's joining this uh, panel also will understand that different brands have different needs and you have to be yes. appealing to, to that brand. That's the key. So if you have passions and you have the integrity and the knowledge to create content about uh, luxury products, you have to sound yourself in that way. So you have to produce not just a one-time thing, but more consistent to what you're producing as a content creator. And then the second will be is like really understand what the brand is all about. I mean, what it stands for. And for me, just being tactical a bit for marketers like me, I will be so in awe when I browse or even curate a content creator that really understand my USB. Just being frank, <laughs> because like it's a little bit like complicated in a way. Yeah, but when you when someone even can pronounce it well, it's like wow, okay. Like, so, and I will look through it and I will see who's this person. This what the what, what is his background or, or can we work with them? Let's uh, let let's reach out or or repost the post itself in our our organic platform, something like that. That's fantastic. And as a marketer, where do you yeah. go to look for your UGC? Where do you find your okay. UGC? So basically, um, for marketers, uh, yes, we have like strategic partners in terms of publisher or agency. But from the marketer side, um, from the, our internal, we always have this kind of like a strategy to to create an unbranded campaign. This kind of like like a trend right now. Because it, let's say just being tactical, if you put an hashtag already uh, with a brand, it's coming. It's 
is already like uh, making it sounds more like a tactical thing. It's more like from the brand side drives this campaign. So we try to make like a campaign or a hashtag that is more subtle, that is unbranded. Let's say the core of BMW is joy. So we create a hashtag called incomparable joy. So that will be something that we engage and communicate throughout our campaign. And we will ask the, our audience first thing first to share something what is joy for them. So that kind of like really pinpoint a, a pool, creating a pool where we can see that we can analyze, oh, this is the engagement uh, from our unbranded campaign and we can dig deeper, deep, deep dive really who are those people and then we create another strategy that can really progress and pinpoint and maybe engage one on one. So to, to create another longevity for the campaign itself. That's amazing. Um, you know, folks, yeah. all those that are watching, I think the most important thing to learn from what Ang just said is that the biggest brands in the world are reaching out to you for content. They're saying that, hey, we're open. Creators, regular people, submit, 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 because your content can be seen. Uh, you will, yes. you know, the brand will extract the value and you as a creator will get um, your, your content seen all over the world. Um, folks, you, you must ask questions. I, I need to remind you to please ask questions to everyone at the end of the session. Uh, you know, the, the, the minds that we're, we're picking today are incredible, and I, I hope we get a whole ton of questions. I, I, and I have another, I have, I have one more for you, is what are the challenges you see around UGC? What concerns you around the content? Because it's okay. important for creators to know what not yes. to do. Yes, correct. So basically for brand, brand for brand there's like in terms of communication actually what they need to understand as well that we are in two different pillars as a brand there's like marketing and also there's pr so marketing uh, marketing communication is more to create a certain objective or kpi maybe it's too big for now to understand but for if the that that ugc also is tapping also to the pr side of the brand so like uh the 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 safetyness um, and not to sound to have a negative impact for the brand. That is something that you must uh, avoid to, to do that. I know that honesty is the best policy, but you can always have to have like a very critical, constructive uh, content that really can pinpoint your opinion to things. So it's it's best that you you understand how to create your content in a in a way that is also safe can then can be preserved and accepted uh, also from the brand side even though it's maybe it's not something positive but you have to find a way to do it I think that's the key that's really really helpful again you know Chanpri talked about curation when you when and this is I'm, I'm speaking more to the audience. When someone is going to curate the content that you submit, you have to ensure that it's brand safe, it's it's you know appropriate, yes. and of course as as best in terms of quality as you can as you can muster. These days the devices are fantastic, so we we generally get you know really really good stuff across all social platforms. But but yeah. folks, it's very important to think about the fact that your content could be used by someone like Ain at a brand, or someone like Chanpri that a publisher or a media company uh, and we'll get to you know ash in a second so keep in mind that that there's a lot of that out there today and it's getting curated so you must follow some guidelines and and you know there are a lot of those guidelines out on the on the internet but we're also always happy to to help uh and thank you this was really really interesting and again time has flown i'm going to go to ash yeah. next and then we'll come back to a joint session Hey, Ashley. Welcome. Hey. Hi, Ravi. Thank you. Folks, Ashley also is sitting in Indonesia along with Ain, and uh, he's the Chief Business and Growth Officer at Wonderman Thompson. I'd love to hear from him why he is on this panel, why is UGC important, uh, and then we'll go into what Wonderman is planning to do with, with this type of content. Thanks. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, maybe I'll just like not waste much time uh, talking about myself, but 
just my my two lines would be oh, always uh, modest i'm uh, no but reality is uh, i've been yeah i'm almost completing a decade in in indonesia now it's it's been an exciting journey uh, moving over from india to uh, indonesia learning the ropes uh, i've sat across i've been fortunate to sit across publisher brand and now finally uh, with with on the agency side where i think i missed the chaos so i was like okay i i i i need to be in the thick of things and 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 that's what brings me here, a passion for for uh, continuous innovation or probably unearthing um, territories that can help build more efficiency for marketers and brands and how do we like bring that together and that's where i stumbled upon you, you and and Jokin, and it's been a great partnership from there on. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, UGC has been like uh, has been ever present in our lives. It's just that I think we've started to take more notice uh, recently. I think um, in the last six years, if you look back, Instagram empowered uh, more than 800 million users uh, to not just upload co any kind of content, but great quality content. And I think you spoke about how devices have gotten better, how technology has gotten better on that space. Uh, TikTok took uh, less than uh, probably half of those years to enable or empower twice X number of users to upload even greater quality content. So I think um, there was no denying the fact, the importance of UGC um, uh, that existed. And, and everyone's fighting for attention today even we are with even with this live stream we are fighting for attention and we are not just only fighting against a, a competitive uh, brand or a competitive um, influencer or or another marketer but we are also fighting against the cat sneezing videos that we sh that we've seen now in the opening we've seen um, uh, an eight year old uh, uh, showing people how to use tiktok filters so the competition has thickened uh, and what COVID compounded onto us was clamping us down, um, restricting production facilities, um, marketing budgets being cut down, so on and so forth. So we, there was no choice but to look at clever ways of, of creating and delivering uh, more engaging and interesting content, I guess. And I think UGC has therefore acted as that fodder to probably open up a, a limitless flow of content, uh, removing those hassles that we always, I think, templated ourselves with that this is how content should be created. I think we all as marketers uh, or, or somewhere down the line were trained to create content that our oh, content creation meant um, big production budgets, huge production facilities, and and more than twenty people at in in one space. And I think I think that was completely being turned upside down, or the script has been totally changed uh, with UGC now taking center stage. So uh, I, it's it's part and parcel of everything that we start to do now. Every one of you on this panel could take my job. You guys sell UGC so well. Uh, it's 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 amazing. Um, yeah. Tell me, Wonderman has you know been known as a data company. You're now looking at a new product, a new brand. How do you engage with your clients and you in introduce these new, you know, uh, innovation not innovations but initiatives rather actually? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. And how does the region perceive? How is the region perceiving this new UGC push? So I think. What came to our advantage was because we, we as agencies are involved in the very creation of the brand uh, from, let's say, right from maybe not the inception of it, but in the next stage of actually when it's starting to deliver into the market and, and we are right in the thick of things. Uh, I think what we have started to do better was to realize that marketing or marketing campaigns uh, were no longer a, a, a one-off event, right? I think I think it's a it's a constant process, and as we see brands evolve, marketing has had to evolve over the years, and it's been that continuous need to unearth or or spot trendy, authentic content or platforms or publishers or or technologies. Um, 
right? And that to then marry it with what the consumer needs are. And Shanpreet spoke about that, I guess. Uh, and Ian touched upon it that at the end, it's it's uh, the perception of the consumer has gotten much more smart or much more sharper in terms of radar, and they 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 seek more for reality and credibility. Uh, right. And, and I think what started from one celebrity influencer, like Shantweet said, the one Bollywood star uh, to, to hundreds of 200s or thousands of micro influencers is uh, in a single campaign. And, and the next logical step, therefore, is how can we then tap into or step that uh, take that further with uh, everyday users, which is what we are seeing with TikTok and, and stuff. So the, the role of Wonderman Thompson, even from a regional perspective, has always been to how can we unite these two economies, the creator in economy and the connection economy, if I have to say so. And um, how through our product of Content Plus, and that's that's what we have uh, in collaboration with Jukin, powered by Jukin, if I'd say, um, in market and we've uh, uh, piloted that with Indonesia. It's received great responses thus far. Every every I haven't seen any brand that hasn't been interested in it. And now we are in in this phase where we are trying to uh, use that template across across the Southeast Asia region. So I think um, uh, I think that's that's where we are. That's the, that's that's how brands have also shown positive perception of how finally UGC has come around. Uh, and, and we've been able to do that using data technology um, as well as creativity to kind of unpack that solution for our clients. Super. Thanks. And what, so I asked Ayn the question, what platforms does she go to to find UGC? I'm going to ask you, what platforms do you find the most success on with UGC campaigns? Um, if I'd say, um, I think... UGC has the ability to sit anywhere. I think. I think. I, I, I think it's not predefined by where it can be. I think we've we've we are currently working with brands that want to use UGC for events. We are, we're working with brands that they want to feature in, feature it in their marketing campaigns. Are but obvious. But we are also talking at the length of how UGC can actually uh, fill the gaps that always on cannot. Right, uh, especially with this scenario where we are having restrictions in order to source content. Uh, so UGC is currently trying to sit everywhere, whether that's publisher, whether that's um, even in kiosks, I'd say, or 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 even uh, within digital billboards uh, that that matter. But uh, the obvious or 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 the most efficient right now, where you can seek some credible. <laughs> Uh, validation is 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 social, uh, and that's where I think consumers provide that validation to brands of trust and authenticity. So I think that still remains the foreground of where UGC lives, but we've seen that being expanded into different territories. Excellent. Um, again, this was too short, but I have to move into a place now where all of us are going to talk to, uh, speak together. Uh, Ash, thanks oh. so much for that. That was great. Thanks. Folks, please, another reminder to send your questions. Uh, I, ha I can go on all day. I have so many, but we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, we'll now go into a joint session with, with all of us on the screen. And we're back. Hi. Thank you again, folks. Uh, really, really insightful. Chantpreet, I want to come back to you on that OTT question because we didn't get a chance to touch upon what UGC means for the OTT world. And after that, I'll move into uh, you know a few questions that I have for all of you. To be honest with you, um, in India, uh, Ravi, OTT is still uh, defined as premium. Okay, uh, the new the new world OTT, and whether we look at the uh, and most of the OTTs that we have right now are still dealing with the overload of available content, whether it's their old TV content or the new content that they're creating. And there's a huge shift to gaming. In fact, I feel that there's a lot of uh, content around gaming that's coming in. And it'd be very interesting to see um, if you're already starting to see how individual creators who have very successful YouTube channels, 
which is an open ott with ugc are pivoting towards gaming in a big way and gamers are creating a lot of content that's a very interesting trend for us but other than that i think there is a very clear distinction in india uh, of user generated uh, content being on open platform otts like youtube i think that's going to remain for a while whereas the other otts that are coming in are still focusing on brand safe environment creating an environment that where uh, their created or curated content can sit first I, i don't know if you're seeing a different trend in indonesia i'd love to hear from ian or ashley be interesting to know yeah i i think Guys. to your point i think it's uh, i uh, am i audible sorry yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah i think i think pretty similar i'd say i think but i think gaming as 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 picked up i think uh yes. indonesia is now like i think top 3 markets in the world if i'm not wrong when it comes to gaming consumption and there's some interesting thing happening in that space um uh, trading of social currency and and content currency shifting and yes. that's an interesting space to watch i guess and it'll be and, and that's purely ugc i mean i mean these gamers come up with whatever they feel like and and there's no limitations or boundaries around that governs them uh and we've seen that with a lot of a lot, lot, lot of uh, uh, large scale like all the mega games and all that 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 exist ott is still pretty much very restricted to i think i think ott has become netflix now uh for 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 everyone year uh and and it still hasn't opened up yet we've got some uh cloud sourced content that that starts to make its way but it's still very much in its very nascent stages of of calling it true ott i'd say so so i'm going to i'm going to ask vidcon to help us set up a whole session on ugc the future of ugc on ott because i think there's so much to talk about so much to debate this could get quite controversial because in india i feel that there's still such a huge focus on long form commercial content the drama the script um but there is a huge market for the non scripted ugc which i'm 100% sure is coming it's already in the west i mean there's a lot of consumption of that content and it's coming here as well but we'll we'll get to that i have a couple of really good questions from the audience and uh i'm and it's for everyone so the first one is from akash doshi um we 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 verify all the content before it is uploaded on various social media platforms is there anything else we should exercise i uh, i will resume this is when he says we verify it could either be as a creator or it could be as uh, a publisher so maybe chanpreet take a stab you're you're a mute sorry uh, i was just saying that akash if you're a content creator um then being authentic to your community which uh, just the way ian men- ian mentioned that she needs content that's authentic to her brand and her positioning and the voice or the messaging she's looking at all you need to look at is how authentic you are to the community and the audiences that you're serving um of course you're very and if you're looking at it from a publisher point of view i think there is a lot of complexity that has come in uh um, you know when we look at content it's not just the fake news filter anymore it is how offensive the content gets you may think as a creator that it's not offensive you're just being authentic but what it means for brands or regulation or the communities that the publisher is serving they have their own point agenda to look at um i don't want to mention a brand but i want to leave you with a very funny anecdote we created a very interesting documentary in one of my previous roles on sex education and only because it had the word sex in it all the open platform otts just create put made us put a warning sign against it because they said you're talking about sex education we said this is 7 plus according to us they're like absolutely not you know it's it'll have a warning sign and people have to click that they're 18 it's almost the other protocol right we got zero views 
And so we had no choice but to strike a deal with a premium OTT platform behind the paywall and say, let's just take off the content in any case. So if you are a good content creator, but you know, I get what my perspective was, but the publisher was just like, if someone takes offense, my my team will go behind bars. So it's a no go. So we could have very funny situations without anyone intending to hurt any emotions or sentiments. I think I think I think for me it'll be I mean, regardless of this is either a creator, buyer or or anybody, is think before you click share, think before you click upload and think <laughs> before you buy now. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Ain, anything to add? Uh, what should they be um, careful about? What should they be thinking about? Okay. Um, actually, the if the, I think from Akash, uh, question will be is like they've already created uh, this content, right? So for me, also from brand team is consistency. It's also key. So we can see the journey itself because we want to have integrity, integrity as well with the person that we are going to collaborate or we want to purchase the content or or share the content in our organic uh in our own platform so maybe to scale up the content from content creators maybe you uh there's a common ground or common goal or a common campaign that you can bind together and make a collaboration so basically it will scale up and it will be showcased somehow the brand team feels that this is like something that's bubbling under is a movement going on is something that is a, a very um, talk about point of view so on and so forth that's what where will intrigue the brand to know more about the content I think thank you so much that, folks Aka, thank you so much Akash I hope that that was helpful um, another question from Emma what's a great UGC campaign that you think we should check out that's a good one. And maybe you start with that, with, with this one. Um, I think I can't say much for this because I am very focused from the brand team. So everything, my, my perspective within always from my lens. So I think I will only see something that is so related to what uh, the brand is all about. Basically, that's it. Great. Ash, anything you've seen that one yeah. should look at, go and look at? I, 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 I did want to bring in the, the Kit Kat example that, that we've been talking about, right? And I think, I think um, Emma should, uh, maybe if you can get her contact, we could probably share that with her. Uh, it's something that, that, that Jukin and, and Wonderman Thompson globally put together for, for Kit Kat is basically curating, I think, more than 300 videos um, of all the UGC that exist. And they've actually um, changed the entire social calendar and replaced it with UGC content. So there's like a video that every yeah. goes out every two days and it's all UGC content and it's powered or wrapped with it within the Kit Kat. Um, uh, let's say rapper in the sense so you've had like you uh, like like we've seen like fails while skateboarding or or people taking a break and and, and whatnot right so uh, that that's a that's a great example if you want to see the utilization of UGC at scale I mean there are great examples on YouTube when you see one great UGC or, or another but if you want to see something at scale I think that's the one and and my favorite YouTuber has always been MKBHD which is Marcus Brownlee and his evolution as a tech YouTuber where he was reviewing laptops uh, 20 years back and as a young kid and now he is the number one YouTuber in that space and if you just watch his journey and how he has grown uh, from being a, 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 a creator from his bedroom to having this fancy studio with the, the, the sophistication of all production facilities and the, the authenticity with which he talks about, I think, I think it's, it's quite great. So I think these would be the two ends from a brand perspective and from a creative perspective on, on what to watch for. Thanks so much, Ash. Um, folks, more requests for questions, uh, putting it out there. I, like I said, I can go on and I can ask questions all day long, but it would be great to have your points of view. 
until we get more from the audience, I have one for all of you. Um, you know, UGC is considered cheap. It's considered abundant, right? There's a lot of it out there. So when people are in the business of, of thinking about using UGC, they expect it to be free or inexpensive, um, which, is a, which is a misconception. It's a misunderstanding because there's a lot that goes into the creation of the content as well as the licensing, the copywriting, you know, all of that. What do you guys think? How do we educate businesses on this and, and you know, take away that misconception that it's, it's just because it's out there on social media doesn't mean that it's free or cheap? John Preet, let's start with you. Uh, see, uh, I just want to say that there is definitely a problem of supply versus demand, right? Uh, there is so much of bad UGC, substandard UGC available. I'm really being candid here. Uh, that the moment you categorize the term UGC as a mass term, there is a lot of uh, miscommunication or mis room for misinterpretation. I think saying, uh, you know, I think news industry has done this really well. There is this whole standardized concept of freelancers who are putting in a lot of their own money, taking their risk and going and getting the best stories, video stories, text stories and reporting. And they are uh, now, now this is institutionalized that there is a certain quality of content that comes and it's not cheap, right? Uh, some of that is even commissioned. Uh, and uh, some of these freelancers even get training uh, for being able to produce a certain quality of work consistently, uh, which is why a New York Times or a Vice or a Times of India or whichever one is a relevant uh, publication is working with them. So I think that it needs to be not just training, but also recognition of what is UGC, uh, you know, putting in different classifications. I think it's very critical. And uh, second, I think, is uh, just the moment there is a certain quality of UGC, like Ashley was mentioning, and we've seen with certain brands, the moment a certain type of content or a certain curator or a certain creator starts to go viral, I don't think price becomes relevant at that time. Then it's about yeah. the um, credibility of that content creator sure. that just allows them to charge a premium. I think one service... Uh, that publishers and brands and agencies like all of us are in the same room can do is educate the freelancers today i think they are uh, they are the ones who are trying everything they can but they don't have any guidance unlike our own uh, employees who have the best in class training technology access to all facilities so that's so i think this is the, the key word the education the key yeah. word is the but, education right today Sorry, I was just saying that today people should know that they can get paid for the content they create. Even if it's a regular video taken on the beach with your phone, there, if it's a good video, there is a potential, a possibility and an opportunity to earn from that video. And that's where folks like us come in, right? The, the four of us are here for that. So we want to encourage and educate people to tell stories with their devices. There is, a, there is a home for the fun stuff, right? You can sing and dance in front of your video, put it on TikTok, there's a home for it. But for, for other purposes, to be used in a BMW ad or in a KitKat ad or uh, on a publisher's curated platform, it has to make sense. It has to be a story. But again, it's doable. It's, it's possible. World over, we're doing yeah, this. I think, I think, um, I think, Ain, sorry, go ahead. I want to add, um, yes, yeah, so I think just to add to what Shantpreet said, I think the one thing that we've started to do with brands is because we've got access to that data point uh, is try to compare them if what it would it take for them to produce this on its own hmm. right if they had to do this on its own uh it's already cheaper i mean and it's probably even more authentic quality content yes you might have a more fancier director shooting it by all means a brand can do that but when you start to do that comparison, uh, UGC will sound more, not sound, it is cheaper, right? But that's, I think, that's one way for us to compare it. Like if this was supposed to be done by a brand team, how much would this cost you? Not just in terms of um, the, the investment, but the resources, the process and the time in order for you to come through it and navigate all your internal processes and 
10,000 other uh, approvals versus this going live in the next 10 days or so, right? Like, and, and, and when you try and see that as, as uh, through that lens, it will, you'll see much more benefits than it being cost effective only, but also how do you find the loopholes in, in, in your huge organization and try and like still carve out a more interesting message for your consumers. You're, you're giving away your secrets, Jeffrey. You're giving away your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually a great segue into this question we've gotten from someone in the audience. It's amazing how this is fitting. Uh, Manu asks, what would drive a brand like BMW to use UGC versus creating their own content? How, how okay. timely is that? OK. So basically, from, um, from I, I'm, I'm lucky to say that um, I'm working uh, to, with a very well-known brand. It's been a hundred years brand. Lah. So we have this UGC going on for quite some time. So we have this brand evangelist, the, the fans of the brand, like creating this organically, basically. So for brand team itself, we appreciate that. We really appreciate that we engage them. If we see that this content is from our brand evangelists, our, our brand fans, it's really good. It's very shareable. We want to share it to the our platform, even to the whole wide, worldwide region. First of all, we will reach out. First, we will re reach out. We have the respect to ask them, can we share this? We can give them accreditation for this content and so on and so forth. But when it comes to a very strategic and refined campaign, what, this is where UGC will come in. So we will work closely to our, with our partners in terms of this is our uh, strategic uh, agency and also the publisher as well, because um, we really want that the UGC content can give the best benefit to the brand itself, Kito. So, so basically, the safetyness is key here. So we need to really um, curate. But in terms of like what Ashley said, when Ashley was just explaining from his side, I just like kind of like reflect like, oh, this is like kind of like my agency trying to convince how to reduce uh, reduce budget, you know, from my budget. So to be clear, I think partnering with UGC content creators and with publisher as well. It's a very um, effective in terms of budget. Yes, it is very efficient, but we will not jeopardize the safety of the brand. That's first thing first for us. So to have a very refined strategy to how to use this content is, is always going to be a discussion until we say yes, we will use it, we will uh, even have this uh, payout for the content creation or engage them further or use them as a full on campaign, something like that. Thank you. And, and Manu, just to add to what she said, uh, what, what, what I've seen in my experience, what we've seen at Jukin is that the big brands will continue to make the big TVCs, the glossy, you know, uh, huge ads and run those campaigns. What we what what UGC does is it provides uh, fodder for additional content. It's it's a lot. It's supplemental. You can create a lot more very quickly, cost effectively, and then get it out on digital platforms. Like Ashley was mentioning, what we did with were KitKat, it was essentially to get as much content out there as possible without breaking the bank, right? So uh, there are various reasons why the big brands will do both. They will have the big campaigns, and then they will have the smaller digital campaigns that will revolve around UGC, but have as much of an impact, if not more, because your next question is also great. Guys, he has a phenomenal question, and this is going to be our last question before we wrap up. Uh, he's, Manu says, what measurement metrics would play a role? Which is great, because I was going to go down that road anyway. So um, yeah. anyone, Ash? I think, I think that's been the common theme here. I think so that's brand advocacy and trust if you want to measure it from an equity standpoint. Uh, so I think those two is what you should uh, measure and UGC against. I mean, yes, there are these other hard metrics of engagements and views and all that, which, which I think is part and parcel of any content that you put out there. But I think if you can measure and if you, you can use data technology to measure the inspiration or, or to evaluate those aspirations behind uh, the engagement, 
uh, to, that leads up into trust or advocacy. I think I think that's that's the two metrics, and of course measure ROI because that's that's the best proof of the pudding that you could have today, right? So measure the ROI that that you would have using UGC versus the rest. And, and I think that's a very simple mathematical equation uh, to arrive at. So I think these would be, I think, the way to measure. I'm sure from a publisher standpoint, Shantreep would have a, uh, have a more interesting way of evaluating that. But I think from a, from a pure content perspective, I think these would be three, three metrics. Breathe any last so from thoughts our point before of view, we hand it back? Yes, from our point of view, it is content consumption. That's the ultimate rough metric that works. Metric. Was it viewed? Was it consumed? Uh, did it uh, uh, did it bring uh, did it increase stickiness of the user? For us, all that matters a lot because, like I said, as a publisher, we first serve our community, and yeah. if if the content serves our community, then it makes sense for us. Well, folks, I can't say thank you enough. Uh, the time has been too short. I really, really hope one day the four of us get to sit over a coffee and discuss this, you know, a lot more in person. There's just so much to talk about on this subject. Um, Vidcon, thank you again for having us. Uh, we're going to hand it off to Jasper now. Um, adios. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Uh, brilliant session. Brilliant speakers. Um, some really great content there. Uh, what do we learn? Um, it's about big numbers, some really big numbers. Uh, it's about being consistent. Understand the brand. UGC can sit anywhere. Um, measurement can be via content consumption, uh, but also measure via ROI. I thought the best thing, I, the best note I took there was uh, the brands want you. So, uh, so thank you again. Um, up next. Uh, in two weeks' time, we are heading east to Japan, the land of the rising sun and Asia's largest entertainment market. After that, we are heading to Korea to discover more about K than just pop. But until then, thank you one more time to Ravi, Ayn, Ashley, and Chanpreet, and have a, uh, a great day. Thank you. <laughs>